Here at River Cottage, I've seen high summer come and go. It's now September. The courgettes are running amok and the peas have developed a nasty grey fungus. Still, the slugs keep coming. But my biggest pest problem is happening not in the garden, but inside the house. And the source of the problem is right here, in the cupboard under the stairs. Look at that. Luxury accommodation for mice. The evidence is everywhere. When there were only a couple of them, I rather enjoyed their company. But now, things are getting out of hand. It's a plague, an infestation. I don't want to kill them. After all, I can't eat them. So what I've been doing is relocating them in the potting shed, but they keep coming back. How do I know that? Because I've been marking them with lipstick. And this one, now I caught him over a week ago, and he's back again. It's just time they stopped taking me for a free ride. Desperate measures are called for. Hello, is that Sue Smith? Hi, my name's Hugh Fernley Whittingstall. I understand that you... Fernley Whittingstall? Yeah, yeah, that's fine, that's fine. I understand that you might be able to help me with a mouse problem. Uh-huh, that sounds brilliant. I'm feeling better now that I've got my mouse problem in hand. Luckily, in Dorset, problem animals come bigger and tastier than mice. One local pest in particular would be a very welcome addition to my larder. Jan Andrews has been managing the roe deer population in this part of Dorset for the past 19 years. A regular cull maintains a healthy herd and prevents the deer destroying forestry and crops. Jan's agreed to let me shoot one for the pot, but first I'll have to show that I'm capable of killing a deer cleanly. Right, you have two shots and you have to put them in a saucer uh, size, two of them, that's all you get. Okay, Goodness, that's say. uncomfortable. It's okay. cracking against my knuckles. That's <laughs> very painful. Right. right. Unlike it's red deer stalking on open it's moorland right. where you lie down to shoot, in Dorset Woodland, a stable firing position is achieved with the aid of two crossed sticks. Okay. It's comfortable. <laughs> Can you see clearly through that scope? Yeah. Well, yes. I must say, he looks rather tiny over there. <laughs> okay. I knocked it over. That doesn't mean anything yet. Well, it means I hit the target no, the somewhere. Wind, the wind could have blown it over at the same time. We need to go and look. Well, that would be very unlucky. <laughs> Looks a bit high. It is a bit high. That's a back shot, which we don't want. So we'll just try again. I'm going to put a little piece of paper on it so you can't cheat. So I'm looking to come about three inches lower than that, yep. yeah? So that's where you want to really be aiming, OK? Sure. So if I can put one in there with the next shot, do I pass the test and get to have a go? You certainly do. That looks better. Perfect. Having proved my competence, I rendezvous with Jan at five o'clock the following morning. The plan is to be in position by sunrise when the roe deer emerge from the woods to feed in the fields. Stalking a row is a waiting game, but Jan has a trick or two to hurry it up. Her fawn call is designed to lure the female deer, or does, and their attendant males, or bucks, closer to the gun. Jan believes passionately in the need to control the deer population with a regular cull. 
Basically, there's more deer now than there have ever been because they don't have any predators these days. So I run a management plan where I take out the old animals and the young animals and it keeps all the good antlered animals and good bodied animals still in the woods to breed. There's certainly no shortage of deer around here, but this morning we're only after a buck. Does are out of season at this time of the year because the fawns are not yet old enough to fend for themselves. But does and fawns are all we keep seeing. It's getting late and the deer are retreating into the shade of the woods. But on our way back for breakfast, Jan finally spots a likely buck. That's the one we want. Um, it's got an awful little head. The head is so protective. Um, it is much um, lighter. He's got a light frame, so he's never really going to make a, a good, strong animal. So this is a really suitable one to take. Unfortunately, he's right on the ridge. We can't shoot him. With no firm ground behind the buck to stop my bullet, this is not yet a safe shot. Okay, just get ready. Don't put your rifle up yet. Oh. To be sure I don't bag a passing rambler, I must wait until the buck comes safely down the slope. gone over now. And with him goes the morning's last chance of a kill. Whatever the outcome of the day, I've set my heart on a stalker's breakfast. So I came armed with some field mushrooms, while Jan has saved the liver of a deer she'd shot the day before. I think it's nice to get that mushroom flavour in the pan before you cook the liver. Fantastic stuff. Look at the colour of that. Happy. Beautiful, isn't it? You. Are you happy to have it a bit pink? I am indeed. Good. The only other embellishment is it goes so incredibly well with liver. It's some fresh sage leaves that I bought from my garden. Mm -hmm. I was that optimistic. <laughs> Roe liver, like lambs or calves, is best sliced thin and fried for no more than a minute on each side. Mmm, that's sage. I'm starving. Good. Me too. Lovely. Very Lovely. nice indeed. It's really delicious, isn't it? It's like sweet calves liver with just a hint of a gamey flavour. Yeah, it is. It's very nice. I was disappointed. That I thought we were going to get a crack in. I mean, I thought he was a very good buck to get and it would have been excellent, but it happens. I mean, that's stalking. I'm hoping the vermin back at River Cottage are going to prove more cooperative. They should do, as I've called on the help of West Dorset's most notorious mouse hit squad. Oh, hello, young man. How are you doing? Hey. Hello. Sue and Steve Smith have a reputation for ruthless efficiency in getting rid of vermin, which is odd because as vegans, they literally wouldn't hurt a fly. So tell me, Hugh, how do you actually spell your name? <laughs> F-E-A-R-N-L-E-Y hyphen W-H-I-T-T-I-N-G-S-T-A-L-L. -L. Good Lord. Got it? I wish I hadn't asked. <laughs> is, is that a posh family or are you Irish? <laughs> Very posh family. Very posh indeed. Sue and Steve don't approve of poison or traps. What they like to do with household pests is have a nice cosy chat. We, we were really quite amazed the first time we did it because we asked them to leave. And they, they shot down behind the Rayburn, which is where we, we asked them to go. And for about two years, I suppose, they stayed down there. They really just stayed down behind the Rayburn. We just asked them kindly to go somewhere where they, they won't be a problem, but where they'll be safe and happy. 
I must say I feel partly that it's my fault that it's got to this stage because I lived with them quite happily for a bit, you mm -hmm. know, because there was right. only the odd one or two, and they used to come out and watch me cook, and I, I didn't mind that. That's nice. I mean, that's very nice. But what you must do is you must establish somewhere equally nice for them. Otherwise, obviously, they're, they're not going to, you know, it's like downgrading them to a little semi when they've been used to living in a mansion, isn't it? And you've got well, to yeah. somehow make the semi seem very appealing and attractive to them. With the help of some smouldering sage leaves to clear the mind, and crystals to get in touch with all the kingdoms of nature, Sue starts the mouse purging meditation. And we take some deep breaths and just really drop your thoughts, just clear your mind and just smell the sage and just let that fill your being. Take some very deep breaths, clear all thought from your head and just try to visualize a large mouse right in front of you. Focus on its eyes. Move right in. Focus on its little, little dark eyes, shiny little eyes. Move right in. We would ask you to move to a place of safety and plenty. Visualize the shed. In love, we offer this place to you. And we ask that in peace you leave and go to this place. Blessed be, little brothers. May you be safe. And if that hasn't worked, I don't know what will. I suppose I could have chosen any number of places for my downsizing experiment, but Dorset's special. As a child on holiday here, I fell in love with it. And among my memories, one figure stands out. A local schoolmaster, who also had a string of prawn pots. He kept his boat on the beach where my friends and I played. We pestered him so much that he eventually took us on as crew. It was brilliant. I haven't seen the man since I was nine years old, his name is Mr. Dennis Cheeseman. Dennis! Hello, you. Oh, good to see you. Very good to see you. Yes. Do you know, you look exactly the same. Oh, do I? Well, you've grown taller. Good, <laughs> that's yes, something. Yes, yes. Um, I really don't think there's been a lot of difference. You, you, Would you you're not dressing me? Any, any better, sir. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Your hair's got very untidy, though. And, uh, <laughs> I don't know whether you've been perming it or what. If you come up there, I've got a pair of shears, and I, <laughs> I can trim it for you. I'll yeah. be quite all right, thanks. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll let this lie fallow for a bit longer. <laughs> I think I have changed a little over the years, but Dennis's boat puffin and the prawn potting ritual haven't changed a bit. You know what used to spoil my holidays? It was too rough to go out and put That's the right, yes. I think you, you're responsible for my sea legs. Yes, probably. And just like I remember, Dennis puts on his plastic apron and starts bossing me around. If you get that bucket ready, Hugh. Yeah. I seem to remember we reckon a third of a bucket was a good catch. Yeah. You've missed it. Oh, oh. <laughs> You've missed it. You didn't used to do that. You, you didn't used to miss it. Back, you. I've never seen you miss before, Dennis. <laughs> no mistake that time. Prawns are at their best in September, and for the last 40 years, Dennis hasn't missed a season. He sets his pots baited with half a mackerel every morning and pulls them up oh, the following big. day. You can hear them hopping in there. Yeah. Oh, that's not bad, look. Oh, wow, look at that. Wow. A lot of prawns. Hang on, Hugh, just hold it. Got a few more. Right. 
Look at that. That's not bad for one pot. Waiting for each pot to break the surface hasn't lost any of its thrill even after 25 years. It always was, and still is, a maritime lucky dip. How's that one looking? Oh, it can, if you can hear them flipping about, you know there are some in there. Oh, fantastic. There's a good sized blenny as All right, well. Hold up the bucket. Are they all out? Yeah. And look at Mr. Blenny. Right. See, that was what we used to love as well, all the other things that turned up in the pot. Yeah. And when we were in the rock pools and we caught a blenny like this, it was called a cheesy sized blenny. Oh, yes. Because it was as big as the ones you've got in your pots. <laughs> Missed it again, Hugh. <laughs> That's talking to you. By the time we've finished pulling Dennis's eight pots, we have getting on for half a bucket of cheesy-sized prawns. Today is turning out to be an incredible sentimental journey for me. First seeing Dennis, and now I find myself falling over in the very rock pools where I used to scrabble around as a kid looking for prawns and crabs and blennies. I'm not after any of that today. I'm looking for something that didn't particularly interest me then, but it's going to go very well with Dennis's prawns. Sea lettuce. As I continue foraging for this succulent seaweed, three generations of cheesemans have congregated at the boat hut for a traditional family picnic. Dennis's granddaughter Emma, his wife Pauline, and their daughter Caroline. I had to the chase them the out of the others a bit, yes. but Hugh was very good, very willing. Very willing boy. Oh, they were fond of uh, dissecting things, you know, like those blennies and, and certainly any fish of, that were larger. They were bit ready with the knife at times and uh, but then boys are like that aren't they a bit on the crawl side and you could be a vagabond on the beach you could dress how you That's liked and look how you liked and you didn't even have to wash because you went in and had a swim <laughs> that must have been appealing to the boys <laughs> oh wow that is what a kind of crab is that Dennis has always done his prawns exactly the same way. Boiled for five minutes in fresh water, not seawater, and having drained them, he adds the salt back in by hand. But I've decided to introduce him to something new, a Japanese prawn tempura. Half of my prawns, which have been blanched for 30 seconds in seawater and shelled, are wrapped in a frond of tangy sea lettuce. These join the others with a chunk of spring onion on a cocktail stick. They're now ready for the tempura batter, made from flour, an egg yolk, and just enough cold water to achieve the consistency of thick paint. While the tempura are frying in a pan of hot oil until crispy, I've just got time to knock up a dipping sauce made from soy sauce, rice wine vinegar, and chopped spring onion. Caroline. I'm particularly keen that Dennis should try this. You said you only like your prawns one way. Yes. They're not hot, are they? They might still be a little bit hot. Right. But I think they're all right to pick up. They're good. They're mm. rather good. Do you think they're all right? Well done. I do. That's nice. Very good. Now, there's one thing in there that you said you'd never eat. Mm. That's seaweed. <laughs> Can yes, you find I thought this green might be. <laughs> the prawny picnic soon takes us all back to the old days. You never bothered with girls much, did you? Yeah, you <laughs> or did you? When we I weren't looking. A, I was only about nine. I know, but still. We were all in love with Caroline. <laughs> and <laughs> and I never knew. Well, I bet you did. I, I didn't. I didn't. I didn't. I never knew. We used to get very excited when Caroline came down to the beach. <laughs> were, we a, were we real pests? Did we bother you? Particularly, I don't think. You're all terribly well behaved. Did we say please and thank you? You yeah. did. The 
bounty of my own garden never ceases to amaze me. Just a couple of weeks ago I was mooching down here by the river and I had a closer look at this tree and I realised I was going to get my own crop of hazelnuts. Not only delicious, but a perfect dose of protein for my vegan mouse busters who are coming to lunch. I want to cook a meal they'll remember as a thank you for the banishing of the mice. Everybody's heard the old adage about how freshly picked vegetables taste sweeter. Here in this book is scientific proof of that theory. So making the sweetest possible vegetable risotto is going to be a race against the clock. And it starts now. According to top food scientist Professor Harold McGee, a vegetable's natural sugars start turning into tasteless starch as soon as it's picked. After just four hours, you can say goodbye to half the sugar and most of the flavour. So instead of taking my vegetables to the kitchen, I'm taking my kitchen to the vegetables. By minimising the time between the picking and the cooking, the French beans, courgettes, spring onions, peas and sweet corn in my vegan risotto should be as sweet as Sue and Steve have ever sampled. In go the hazelnuts and just 20 minutes after I started picking, it's done. Bang on time, Sue and Steve arrive armed with a bottle of homemade elderflower wine. There you go, Steve. I think I can put my hand on my heart and say that, with the exception of the odd slug, this is a cruelty-free meal. That's <laughs> wonderful. Yeah, I thought there's not a corpse in sight and it looks delicious. Yeah. Wonderful. <laughs> mm. I'm not a meat-every-day person, but when I do use meat, I tend to make it go as far as I can. Right, right. So quite often, even if I'm having a risotto, there's a chicken or something that's... Um, something that's paid the price. Paid the price, <laughs> as you might say, yep. <laughs> Can't deny that. Do you yeah, try well, and convert? No, I don't, <laughs> because to be honest, I was a corpse cruncher myself up until I was about 26. Corpse cruncher, come on, that is a very loaded <laughs> word designed to make me feel maximum guilt. <laughs> is it not? <laughs> <laughs> I've actually watered down the wine for you, Hugh, because I was a bit wor worried about you eating all those bodies. I thought <laughs> you might be a bit fragile, so... <laughs> it's absolutely delicious, this wine. Yeah, it's not really, bad. it's very dry. Mm, it's a nice one. Here's to the mice. May they never trouble you again. Well, you know, I haven't seen them since you came. Jolly good. <laughs> I'm pleased to hear it. I haven't it. seen a dropping good, since good, you came. Good, good, good. Good, that's so, a relief. <laughs> you seem to have done the trick so far. That's great. Next week, the weather turns very nasty. I'll be preparing Bunny in the Basket, and it's down in one with the Cider Boys.